We have a long agenda, so I'm going to get started right now, like they say on MSNBC. Here's Carl Schechter right now. Let's go forward with our agenda. And I'm going to introduce our mayor, Frank Orris, who is going to tell us a little bit about the uh, seascape, the streetscape project. Thank you, Commissioner. As uh, Commissioner Schechter said, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, streetscape and what has taken place and where we are today. Our streetscape committee started a long, long, it seems like a long time ago. We formed the streetscape committee and there were some very uh, dedicated and interesting, interested people, some most on that same committee today. And we went around the city and we looked at different parts of the city, which we thought we went in actually in a van and we rode around and we said, uh, long before the Pembroke Diner was dilapidated, and we went around the different centers and said, oh, that needs work, that needs landscaping, up and down the boulevard, uh, and we need some uh, 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 way wayward signs other than just you're entering Pembroke Pines. And you can tell when you're entering Pembroke Pines from Hollywood, because with all due respect to the elected officials in Hollywood, they're only interested in what goes on east of 95. West of 95, they've got all these little single business stores right on the street. It's horrible. So when you come into Pines, we want it to look good and we think it looks good. It needs improvement. So with that, the Streetscape Committee started and we had uh, some ideas, had meetings, and then uh, went forward and found that we had uh, money in our bond issue for the Streetscape Committee. Mayor Ben Fiorentino, back then, uh, we started going to the shopping centers to try to entice them to be partners of ours to beautify their shopping centers bring them up to city code. One of the shopping centers we visited was 72nd and Pembroke Road. I, and I, and, uh, I, I, I then was the mayor uh, and Ben Ferrandino started. So we went there not realizing that all of the store owners in that shopping center are individual store owners. The only thing the city owns is the parking lot. How that ever happened, I don't, I don't know. We own the parking lot but they own each store. So we had uh, a plan uh, to have a facade a change, a roof, some apartments in the back, and, and uh, Mayor Fiorentino shaking his head, he remembers. So uh, we had a meeting of the store owners. One owner from New York owned five bays. He didn't show up. So we, uh, we had a good turnout. So we find out individual uh, bay owners wanted help from the city, but could not make a decision because they couldn't reach this gentleman who owned five bays from New York City. Wasn't interested in offering any money. So at the time we were trying to put CRA dollars, community redevelopment dollars, into that shopping center to fix it up. Uh, it, became, it became very difficult to do because of that uh, one uh, person from New York who owned the five bays. So we really stalled that. We had great renderings. Uh, Mary, you remember we had our city uh, planning staff uh, made some great uh, drawings, just never materialized. Because of the money, obviously, and because of the situation at that shopping center. The other shopping center we went to is where the Pembroke Diner was. We met with three different owners. The first owner went like that to us. That's an Italian phrase. I like that. He wasn't interested. He had 99% 90, occupancy. He didn't care. We said, but the center needs work. He said, didn't care. So he sold it. The next property owner, uh, Ben and I met with him. He was in interested. He was interested. He was going to help out. He saw some city dollars. He was going to put some dollars in and fix up the center. Lo and behold, after we're working with him and it's going on and on, he sells it. Now we go to another uh, owner, and he was interested, and it just fell apart. And now you see the Pembroke Diner, uh, it really needs condemnation. It's an ugly, ugly building. And that center needs work. So that all said, we started the streetscape. It's taken a long time. Much of it because of the commission stalling it because we wanted it done right. I mean, uh, it, it should have been done a lot sooner than it, than it has been done. But because of our, our commission, we wanted charrettes, we wanted 
to have these panels, which we did of experts, and then we hired, the commission hired uh, Miller Lake, who's going to be here tonight. That being said, you know, we borrowed originally $100 million. Uh, originally, that was our bond issue for 30 years that the residents voted for, for us to use for a myriad of issues, roads, parks, senior uh, uh, accomplishments, senior compliments, a whole bunch of different things for everybody. And then as we got into the, uh, we did it, the first row, we got a real good interest rate on it. We, we uh, borrowed $47 million. And uh, then we said, well, maybe because of the economics where they were, Commissioner Castillo, Commissioner Saipo, how are you? So we, uh, we decided uh, not to borrow the additional 10. So that dropped down our, our uh, you know, our, our spending of what we had for 90 million rather than 100 million. But uh, as we got into it, Miller Lake came up with a great plan. We, we hired Miller Lake. They came up with a timeline, and we're exactly on timeline, correct? Yep. We're on a timeline. We had charrettes. We had the individual uh, people from the city come out and, and go out, we had a map and we had little circles that we said, put on this circle what you would like to have here, three different categories. And amazingly, most everybody put the same area uh, that they wanted to see fixed. Now, originally Streetscape was done, picture Pembroke Pines as an old spoke, an old wagon wheel with spokes on it. That was the original concept. When you look at the aerial, that's what it looked like. And then, of course, Southwest section was built, and then we went further west, and as, uh, as uh, Andrew hit, as you know, we had our, our uh, elected officials long before me, uh, had all that land out west, and they gave some assessments to landowners because we needed to put infrastructure out west. Never realizing, of course, Andrew would come, and we would get a 65% population explosion. Folks, no one's ready for a 65% population explosion. But Pepper Pines handled it pretty well. And of course, we started moving out west. The old Willie's Bar became St. Edward's Church. <laughs> you remember Willie's Biker Bar? Now St. Edward's Church, that's what's over there. And the Sportatorium is now another area, a nice living area. And as you go out, out west, of course, as it moved out west, newer developments were built. But now, getting to the crux of it, now we have to fix up our city. Because in the, in the context of what we found, we have disconnects as the building took place. And city center is going to be our downtown part of our, our development. And we have to connect all those disconnects throughout our city to make it all viable. We need wayward signs, we need, we need landscaping, we need a category of different things. We're on our way. And so with that, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm going to leave that rest of that up to Miller Lake. Joe Yurchard from the Planning and Zoning Department is going to give us a very quick, a very quick dissertation on Miller Lake's ideas. Uh, Joe has been working with them every step of the way and is very knowledgeable, more so than the mayor or myself. Joe? Uh, as you're all aware, the uh, Streetscape uh, Miller Lake has been working with uh, the city with the Streetscape program. And for those of you who are not aware of what Streetscape is, it's trees, landscape, uh, uh, signage, lighting, things to beautify and also to, to uh, increase function to city streets. Um, the design guidelines are going to be a planning document the city is going to use for future projects and also for developers who come in and wish to develop or redevelop on properties. They'll be able to see what the city is envisioning along corridors and be able to act upon that through their development, uh, through the development process. Middle of the Leg has, done, has met with uh, the city, they've also met with the county, and they've also met with Florida Department of Transportation in order to get their input so that the design guidelines actually become a buildable product. And in turn, they've also met with the citizens of the, uh, at a charrette, which was discussed by the mayor earlier. And also a survey was done online to try to get the needs and the wants of the city. Now, there's just some dates that, were, that uh, came up. On J January 10th, the city was presented the preliminary streetscape guidelines. And we'll leave a couple copies in the back for everybody to look at. 
Um, and coming up in April, they will be doing the final design guidelines, which were tweaks that were made based on commission input from the January meeting. So I believe the first meeting in April it will actually be, will be the design guidelines. If anybody has any questions, we'll be sitting in the back uh, after the meeting's over. We can take a look at these and we can give you a little bit more detail on them. And Miller Lake will be here, and I will be here, and this is Ron Rollins over here from Miller Lake. Uh, let's go right to the next topic, which I know many of you will be interested in, and that's city center. And I'm going to ask Charlie Dodd, our city manager, uh, to give us an overview of what's happening at city center. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I know this map is uh, very small, but as all of you know, the location of the proposed city center is on the southwest corner of Palm Avenue and Pines Boulevard. And it's City Hall is right there on the, on the uh, corner of that intersection. The map that you see in the different colors indicate the, the land uses that the City Commission unanimously approved a few years ago. And even though this land has uh, set dormant for many years, we are now seeing at this point activity. And the uh, building climate has changed. And you will see the parcel here in red, which designates 700 units. The first phase of that, roughly 425 units, uh, is currently under construction. They are moving. Uh, you will be seeing a lot of activity going on at this location. That is important because this entire parcel uh, was purchased with cash that the city had in surplus, and we held it that way. So now uh, we are beginning to receive and recoup that money to go back into our reserves. There have been a lot of other inquiries because of this at this point in time for other parcels, and we are having conversations with individuals uh, and companies who have come to us uh, for the potential development of the site. One other part of city center that was not purchased but the city owned was this uh, kind of uh, upside down, uh, maybe an S-shaped uh, parcel. There's five acres located here that the uh, mayor proposed and we're going to begin the construction of a passive park right at this location. To get an idea, this is Washington Street extended from Hiatus Road. The road curves around and comes up right through city center up to Pines Boulevard. The other 10 acres that you see at this location is one that we are exploring uh, as part of the go bonds in putting together the financials for a potential stimulus for the entire commercial, which is a civic center as had been uh, discussed with the original bond issue. So uh, we anticipate and we look forward to a lot of activity happening in the next year uh, for the sale of the property, for, for placing uh, the property on the tax roll, which does provide income to the city uh, in ad valorem. So within the next uh, year and a half to two years, that certainly, this parcel here will certainly help our tax base. Um, I'm going to ask Commissioner Castillo and Commissioner Seiple to bring you the update on a very hot topic. Uh, yes, <clears throat> the detention center uh, that's being proposed to be built out west, it, it's, a, it's a hot button issue and I'm going to let Commissioner Castillo and Commissioner Seiple address that issue. There's a parcel <clears throat> located uh, just west of 196th Avenue and Sheridan Street. And that parcel is located within the town of Southwest Ranches. It was cherry picked, which means that it was not connected to the rest of the town when they incorporated in 2000. It was then and is today owned by a company called Corrections Corporation of America. They bought it there in order to do on that land, which they own, what they do for a living, which is run prisons or run correctional facilities. For these many years that they've owned it, 
They've not had that opportunity. However, recently, they uh, partnered with the town of Southwest Ranches and with the full support of the town, applied to uh, run a immigration detention center at that location. An immigration detention center is a center where people who are ordered to be deported by a court are held for that period of time that it takes administratively to deport them. Uh, according to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, better known as ICE, because they're a little cold, uh, it takes somewhere between 30 and 45 days, on average 30 days, in order to process someone out of the United States. Many hearings were held within the town of Southwest Ranches without any notice to the city of Pembroke Pines over the years regarding this facility. We had no idea until recently that they were actually planning to create a detention center. By the time that we found out about it, because the town of Southwest Ranches never asked us to participate in those discussions. The, discuss the conversation with ICE had been pretty far along. And this past May, it was, in the words of ICE, leaked into the Miami Herald that the town of Southwest Ranches had been picked by ICE as the finalist for this facility. This facility had originally been planned for 2,500 beds. This city commission found a way to bring it down to 1,500 beds. It is still going to be the largest such facility in the United States. The people out in western Pembroke Pines and pretty much throughout the entire city are manifestly against having this facility in, our, in, our, in Pembroke Pines because it is inconsistent with and incompatible with our lifestyle. It is not the type of facility that we welcome here. What's the problem? Just say no, we can't. Why? It's not located within our town. If it was located within the city of Pembroke Pines, we would say no. But what's striking about this, and one of the reasons why the legislature, even though they approve this, typically don't like the idea of cherry picking, which means picking a parcel that's surrounded by other neighbors not connected to your city and making it part of your city, is this. This will be a textbook case study of why uh, cherry picking should not be permitted. The impacts in terms of traffic, in terms of noise, in terms of sight and sound, in terms of community impact will exclusively be felt by the city of Pembroke Pines, which it surrounds, not by the town of Southwest Ranches, which governs it. Southwest Ranches, however, will receive significant revenue from this facility. It will receive property tax, and under ICE's construct, the way they do business, is that they actually pay the town for the services of CCA. The town takes I think it's 4% or some percentage off the top for them, and then they pay ICE the rest. This is the way that our immigration service uses cities to help them site facilities that would otherwise be very difficult to site. This has been a, a significant problem. Uh, we were involved in entanglements uh, that we have elegantly found a way without any liability to the city of Pembroke Pines to date to get out of. However, we don't get to make this decision. And the decision really rests with the federal government and the town of Southwest Ranches. However, we have not been silent. We have objected vigorously. And I think for the first time in the city's history, we actually sent a resolution to the White House, to the President of the United States, asking him, because our other federal officials would not listen, to intervene and to support our position in opposition of this center, citing reasons that all sort of stem back to our feeling that it is incompatible with our community. There are many communities in Florida that would welcome this facility. Pepper Pines is not among them. And we made that clear to the White House. Unfortunately, we have not yet heard back from them. But I hear say that residents are actually calling the White House 
and saying, why haven't you responded to our city commissioners? And the more of those residents that call, maybe some of you will, uh, the more likely it is that we will get a response. To give you a fuller sense of, uh, of, of the issue, I'd like to present my colleague, uh, Commissioner uh, Iris Seipel, in whose district this uh, facility resides. Thank you. For me, the real issue is you all, our residents of Pembroke Pines, are going to be the ones who are going to be impacted in so many ways, negatively impacted by this uh, facility should it be brought into that, into my, it's actually in my district out west. Um, some of the issues that I, that I hear, and I don't want to just say these things to sound like I'm trying to be very dramatic or what have you, but they're issues. When we ask the, the, the questions of how would this work on a daily basis, how would detainees be um, removed or let go from this facility? The answers that we got were, well, they'll take them down, maybe drop them off at a bus. I think that's a pretty bad answer. The nearest bus happens to be at our beautiful academic village. We have our high school students there. We have families that live around there. Are you kidding me? Is this an answer that they would give you what they're going to do with these folks that are there? We went to the meeting at, um, out at the library several months back when some of the folks from ICE were actually there. And I know they were asked a number of questions and um, uh, Director Mead actually answered one of the questions when he said, at any given time, 50% of the folks that will be detained in this facility will be a criminal. They're not there because they are there for criminal charges, although they have these criminal charges. They are there because they are there for immigration issues. They just happen to be, have criminal charges aside from all of that. You know, it just, it just really kind of boggles my mind how someone would think that a facility like that belongs in a beautiful city like, or impacting a city like Pembroke Pines. It's just so not compatible with anything that this city stands for. We have families out there, we have schools out there. We pride ourselves with all the, all the amenities that we have out there. Why would we stand still and be quiet about something like this coming into our area and, and so negatively impacting us? There's a lot of talk about the financial end of it. I know you all have read things in the paper that, and you may have gotten mailers at your home that have talked about, well, I think it's, I, clearly think it's propaganda. What they are saying are these sort of fear factor things that they're throwing out to you all. If you don't support this, if the city doesn't support this, if the city doesn't stop trying to find ways to, to put a stop to this, we're going to lose a lot of money. Well, you know what? I'm not so sure that we're going to lose a lot of money. And I think that when you actually start looking at what you think that you may lose, money-wise, what you are going to lose um, in the quality of life that we spend such good money on every other day of the year to maintain in this city, it clearly for me is not an equal balance. Clearly is not. And I can't, um, have not been in support of this since, since day one. And, you know, I, I saw the things that were happening and the things that could potentially happen out there. Um, Health and safety is just such a major factor for us, and, and everything that we do in the city points to the quality of life, how we cherish our families, how we look at uh, and provide wonderful services from our very youngest to our oldest. And again, if you want to talk dollars and cents, we spend a lot of money, spend a lot of money providing those services. And for something like this to come into our town, come into our city, and to say, um, we're here, and now Pembroke Pines is going to be known not necessarily for its wonderful senior center, not for its wonderful charter school systems, not for its wonderful parks and recreation that we have, the things that we provide, and not for its wonderful city commission. Um, but we're going to be known as, oh, that's, oh, that city, that town down there that has that, that prison in it, that detention center in it, 
I'm sorry, folks. There's no way. There's no way that that should be anywhere near uh, and attached to the city of Pembroke Pines in our name. Southwest Ranches, had they have wanted to have this wonderful facility, they had open land in their own town that they clearly, and since they could control zoning, they could have put it in their own town. And I don't know why they didn't do that. I guess because they thought maybe their folks wouldn't like to have all of that impact, wouldn't like to have all of those criminals dropped off at the bus to find a way to go home or wherever they need to go. There are still cities out there that are begging for this to come to them. But it is not areas that, like, that are even close to Pembroke Pines. They are, um, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful at all, but they are cities that are lower income, have very few um, uh, well-established housing areas near them. So anything that would come in that would generate a few extra dollars for them is more than welcome because they don't have much. They are not a Pembroke Pine city. So I know that you all have gotten flyers in the mail, you've gotten robo phone calls, you've gotten all of those things. Please look at it for what it's worth. It is a mere scare tactic for you all to say, hmm, well, maybe we should look at the money and we shouldn't look at the quality of life. But the reality of it is that's not a true statement. And I would just ask that you all really keep a very open mind and look at all of those factors that are involved in this and, and do the right thing as you always do to maintain the quality of life that we have in Pembroke Pines. Thank you. I think Vice Mayor Seipel really hit it on the nose when she said, Pembroke Pines will be known for the detention center. The problem with that is, it's not our detention center. It belongs to Southwest Ranchers. We can't, we can't stop it legislatively. We just can't. There's nothing we can say or do that will stop it. But what we have done is we've taken a position that as a community, as a city, we don't want that detention center built where it's proposed. Because the fact of the matter is, it will be identified with Pembroke Pines. So uh, we're doing everything we can to slow it down or to stop it. I hope we succeed. Let me now go to uh, my friend Sam Gordon. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'll have a couple of minutes just to brief you on a couple of things that you've been reading about in the newspaper regarding ethics in Broward County. A couple of pieces of history which I think warrant your, your thinking. Uh, in the year 2000, Commissioner Castillo was on the Broward County, County Charter Review Commission, which had a two-year term of office, and one of the principal issues that they placed on the ballot in 2002 was a request for Broward County voters to consider requiring the Board of County Commissioners of Broward County to adopt an ethics code. It was an item that 13 or so items that went on the ballot, each of which passed. Uh, there was a requirement, and the voters approved it, that there would be a, a Broward County ordinance regarding ethics. Unfortunately, the county commission chose to not do that. They actually didn't implement an ordinance and did not implement a requirement for ethics imposing upon themselves. In the year 2006, the Charter Review Commission met again. Patty Good sitting in the audience was on the Charter Review Commission in 2006, and they took the, they took the, the baton from Commissioner Castillo. And essentially what they did, a lot of history in this room, by the way, yeah. and in 2006, that Charter Review Commission, among around eight or nine different charter questions, added one very unique question. And what it said, and the voters in this room, and some of you did vote for it, I'm sure many people did, was among the nine or ten questions that the question asked the voters was specifically the following. Shall there be an ethics code for the county commission? And shall it be adopted specifically by the recommendations of an ethics commission. And the charter question which was passed created an ethics commission, a short-term organization comprised of many different people, 11 different members. And one of the members was Commissioner Schechter. He was an appointee of that board and actually served on the charter review, strike that, the ethics commission for Broward County. And one of the unique portions of that item, which is very important tonight, is the fact that it said to the county commission, that when the Ethics Commission finished its work and provided an ethics code, the County Commission would have several choices. It could accept the code and impose it upon itself, 
or it could reject the code, and then at that time, the ethics code itself would go on the ballot for consideration by the voters. The Broward County Commission chose the former. They chose not to object to what the ethics commission provided and prepared, and they were then required to comply with an oath, the code, of, code of ethics for the Board of County Commissioners. Fast forward just for a few minutes if you can, just to get a little history further. And that is that in November of 2010, the County Commission put three items on the ballot, three referendum items one of which was to impose the county ethics code on constitutional officers, the sheriff, the clerk of the courts, the sheriff, uh, the supervisor of election, et cetera, and that passed significantly in November of 2010. The second issue in the ballot was to revise what's called the Office of Inspector General. There's now currently an inspector general in Broward County that's, a, that's an appointed, appointed member, charter officer, separate and distinct from the county commission. Essentially, that item passed the voters in November of 2010. And the third item, which really brings us to the current vintage, is the issue is whether or not there shall be an ordinance in Broward County which will prevail over any city ordinance on ethics, essentially requiring a Broward County ethics ordinance to apply to elected city officials. That passed. The consequence of which is that effective in January the 2nd of this year, this year, there's now an ethics code in place in Broward County which applies to every city in the county, generally except for a few that may have voted out, outside the box, so to speak. They have opted out for some, some, some provisions. But interestingly, the problem or the challenge is that this city commission is now beholden to a specifically significant ethics code, the many items of which, many aspects of which, many concepts of which, they have already been in compliance with for many, many years. This city actually has its own ethics code. It was adopted a number of years ago but it is a rudimentary, applicable code that will now be, be preempted by the County Commission's own ethics code. Just two more minutes if I can, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Commissioner. There, there are several component parts of the County Ethics Code that do require some quick attention. They provided for some very clear definitions that apply to cities. They have some issues regarding gift acceptance and gift giving, which are very restrictive that were not the case in the past. They relate to issues such as outsider concurrent employment. What you don't know is the fact that on this dais, there are, there, are, there are elected officials who work very hard on a full-time basis as our city commissioners, but they also have other lives. They actually have full-time jobs besides. And to the extent that they will now be required on an annual basis to, to actually disclose their, in their compensation for where they work. It's required by the County Ethics Code. We'll have to disclose that information every January, once a year, and the county commissioners describe that they disclose it four times a year. It also has a major impact on lobbying and lobbyist activities. Mayor Ordos can't lobby in Broward County, effective January the 2nd of 2012. He can lobby anywhere else he'd like, but he can't lobby in Broward County. It's the law, and he's complying with that law. It also deals with the issue of what's called honest services, that the folks that sit before you when they make decisions are making them because of the fact that it relates to the issue before them and not some other private purpose or private reason. Solicitation and receipt of contributions. There, there is disclosure requirements for gift giving, gift taking, but also for political contributions, also requiring disclosure, online information. By the way, the city's had that for many, many years. It's nothing new for Pembroke Pines. Procurement and selection. Procurement for professional services and for other, other services. The city commission has not in the past, and will not in the future, be sitting on selection committees to hire people to do certain projects. The code does not allow for that. They've been doing this for a period of years. Financial disclosure requirements, as I mentioned earlier, this is enhanced requirements for them to disclose certain financial information. Key factors are training and education. This commission has a very rich history of having training, workshops on Sunshine Law, public records, ethics, other matters. Now the law requires four hours for newly elected officials. Today was Commissioner Schwartz's first day in the box. He survived, so far as I can tell, from 10 to 2 o'clock. He, he only left the room one time to go to the bathroom. And I offered him many other options and he chose not to, not to exercise them. We're very proud of him. And either he's a camel or he's an instrument or, or he has some other premise that I'm aware of, which I can congratulate. Um, and then it requires for every city commissioner, every year, eight hours of educational service, educational training from the saddle, which we can provide or we can get from the Broward League of Cities or other, other organizations. Um, I want to just brief the commission and those here to understand and know that this city commission has been in compliance with the general concepts of the ethics code for a long, long time. It's now been codified, it's now the law. This is one city which didn't object. They did not object to the, uh, the conditions of the proposals and you have a rich history of membership 
uh, starting from Commissioner Castillo back in 2000 to Commissioner Schechter, who was actually on the Ethics Commission, which did its job, and Patty Good, who was also on, on the, uh, the uh, Charter Review Commission back in 06 through 08. That's the law. Happy to help you. I look forward to it. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. I'm going to talk a little bit about a favorite subject of yours, uh, the red light cameras that we have in Pembroke Pines. Mm -hmm. I know you're all crazy about those. <laughs> Let me give you a little background about that. We entered into a contract back in 2007 uh, with um, ATS. That's what, what, the, what does that stand for? American Traffic Tra Solutions. American Traffic Solutions. And it, it's a wonderful solution for them. <laughs> um, under that contract, and, and you have to understand that at the time we entered into that contract, there was no law that allowed us to write tickets. Only an author, a police officer, could issue a traffic ticket. So, having a very brilliant attorney, I don't think that he thought of it, but somebody thought of it, said instead of calling it a traffic violation, we'll call it a code violation. So that if you pass the red light, you are violating our traffic code. Okay. And so we decided that a fine of $125 would be uh, a good number. And that's what we charged. We had one count on 129th and Pines Boulevard. And I have some figures here that Captain Bermudez uh, supplied me with tonight. The first year that that camera was in operation, um, they issued from March 9th of 09 to February 10th of 10. There were 3,200 violations on that one camera. Just going east. Just going east. Going east. Just east. Okay. Yes, eastbound. Uh, the next year, there were, wait a minute, I've got the numbers here. Captain, if I don't have the numbers right, you tell me, will you? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Do that. Good evening. Like Commissioner Schechter was saying, our first year, the cameras took effect in March of 09. Okay, so from March of 09 till February of 010, or correction, 10, there was 3,200 citations that were issued at that intersection, and there were nine accidents also in that intersection. Uh, the following year, from March 2010 to February of 2011, the accidents went down. We went from nine accidents to seven accidents, and so did the citations. The citations went from 3,200 to just over 3,000. Also, based on the information that we have so far for this year, from March of 2011 um, till December of 2011, and based on the projections that we're going to have through February of 2011, we're going to have four accidents in that intersection. So we went from seven down to four, and we're going to have approximately 2,300 citations. So we went from 3,000 to 2,300, which is almost a reduction of 700 citations, which indicates to us that as people are learning about these intersections and about the red light cameras, they're starting to slow down before they get to the intersections. So that we're reducing the number of accidents that we have in the intersections, and it's also reducing the number of citations that are being issued. Now, Jay, I didn't forget about you. The Southwest Focal Point Community Center, the senior center, is located at 301 Northwest 103rd Avenue, right off of Johnson Street. I recognize so many people here tonight who come to that center. Um, we have just finished pretty much renovating that center top to bottom. I hope you get to come there each day and enjoy it. Many of you may be in need of home health care or information relating to that subject, Medicare or Medicaid information. Um, want to come out and enjoy some social time. We have so many activities and so much information available at the center. We hope that you'll all come, enjoy. Thank you so much. We have some information in the back, but please, you're all welcome. Sorry, you've been very patient sitting there all evening. Would you come up, please, and give us a little bit about community affairs? 
Valerie Davis, ladies and gentlemen, community. Good evening. I'll keep this brief. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, a lot of you know me. My partner Clarence Wilson and I. We come to a lot of your uh, meetings over here and talk about safety. If nobody knows us, then hi and nice to meet you. Um, we come to a community such as this and Senior Center, where we help out with Jay a lot, uh, Century Village, all throughout the city. We'll go ahead and talk to your groups about any kind of safety issue, whether it be fraud, identity theft, um, personal safety, holiday safety, anything such as that. I'd also like to invite you to our Citizens Police Academy if you have nothing to do on a Thursday night. Uh, we just started our class 35. We have a running list for um, classes upcoming, so the next one will be starting at the end of August, beginning of September. It's $35, and for 15 fun-filled weeks on Thursday night between 7 and 10, we will entertain you and educate you on what it's really like to be a police officer, and it's not everything you see on TV like NCIS. So I promise you it's not one of those classes where you sit down and you listen to a, an instructor for three hours and you fall asleep. We make it very interactive. We put you as the role of a police officer and we get to have fun and act like bad guys. And it's very educational and informative. And a lot of people who have gone through the class end up sticking with this, volunteering, riding in our community on patrol program, and also going through parking enforcement. So if that's something you may be interested in, you can call our office at 954-435-6538, and the applications are available online, or just call us in the Community Affairs Unit. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And my colleagues, thank you all for coming and for being part of this town hall meeting. Appreciate it.